now between you and lunch. We have um, one more really interesting talk um, for a speaker I'm going to introduce in one moment, who's, I think, ready to go. Yes, Thomas, are you ready? Fantastic. Excellent. Um, Thomas has joined us um, from IBM Tech Trade and um, will introduce himself and what he does a little bit more and tell you a little bit more about data um, before lunch. So I'm going to hand over to Thomas and please give him a warm welcome. So thank you very much for very way I'm keeping you from lunch. So I'll try and keep it uh, to something that interests you. So when I was given this opportunity to alter, and I can only thank you for, for doing that, I was thinking the first thing, why should you listen to me? Because obviously, especially after Audrey's uh, presentation this morning about uh, all big companies just want you to uh, essentially buy from us, I don't think that's the case from me here. So uh, as you will have just seen, if I press the right button, there we go. Uh, Dame Wendy Hall spoke last year. I uh, actually did some research on the conference as well. Um, and she mentioned here about when in her web conference, which I found very interesting, uh, big data at the bottom down there. Uh, she's talking there about how the web uh, has enabled, is pushing a lot more data out to everyone. And that's part of what I do. So I'm actually part of our big data analytics team at IBM. And then also to top that off as well on Monday, just to help me, uh, Jeff spoke about um, what the, uh, the priorities for education were. And in that, he mentioned as well, uh, just in the middle there, uh, a data-driven world and analytics and, and predictive. So uh, it's not just me telling you that I, I think this is an interesting topic, but there's some key people in, in education who are saying this as well. And there's another person from IBM, actually, Caelan Hargrave. Uh, you'll see his uh, Twitter handle at the end, but if you follow him, he's got some really interesting things to say around this as well. Um, and then the final thing, is, uh, is there anyone here from London South Bank University? No, okay. Well, London South Bank University, I've just invested with IBM um, uh, a lot of money, but uh, the reason behind that is because they're really uh, trying to empower the student and work with the student. Uh, this is actually from a press, re press release on their website that if you Google, you can find, um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about LSBU a little bit later. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about. So I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of what IBM thinks big data is, um, and that's come from the reason why we are, I guess, qualified, is we invest uh, one billion a year in uh, R&D for big data analytics. So it's quite a big tranche of what IBM are looking to do um, in the coming years. Uh, some case studies, so to go back to Audrey again, um, to actually talk about reality and not fantasy and tell you some stories about where it's actually been used, and then actually talk about where it's been used in education, because obviously that's what everyone's interested in. So what is big data? Well, according to Gartner, there's three major Vs. You may have heard of these. Um, so they are volume, velocity, and variety. And that, to qualify to be a big data uh, problem or, or, or just be big data, you've got to have two of those. So essentially, high volume, lots of data. Uh, velocity, how quickly that data is coming to, at you and whether you need to analyze that quickly. And then high variety, so the, the fact that uh, there's now structured data and unstructured data. Traditionally, uh, we've always dealt with structured data and we've dealt with it very well, especially from an IT company like IBM. But how do we actually deal with this new unstructured data, whether that be social media, log analytics, those kind of things. And then there's some interesting quotes here. So one from Clive, Clive Humby, uh, Dun Humby. Data is the new oil. It's just, it is, data is just like crude. It's valuable, but if unre unrefined, it cannot actually be used. And I think that's a really interesting point. So if you've just got data, data is just data. It's just, just a number or, a, or some text. Essentially, once you can do that analytics and, and define that value and where you want to go with it, then it becomes of actually some value to you. And then another one from uh, John Naisbitt, who's an author and speaker on future studies. He's, he's actually pointed out that it's one of the few resources that is not only renewable, but also self-generating. And data will continue to grow and grow and grow. Now, obviously, as we've talked about with Audrey and previous, uh, you know, security and privacy issues do, do become a part of this, and that's something that everyone needs to think about when they're dealing with data. 
but essentially it is going to continue to grow. And there's nothing new about big data. Data has always been growing. That's just been the case for the time. What's new about now is the technology that's available to actually do something with that data, I would argue. So this is IBM's point of view on the characteristics of big data. So yes, we agree on volume and velocity and variety. So volume, as it says on the slide, it, uh, by 2020, there'll be 35 zettabytes of data. That's a hell of a lot of data. Um, and velocity, there's 30 billion, and this is, this is uh, over a year old slide now, so I, I don't know whether that number is still actually true, it's probably more. Uh, in fact, I, Jeff on Monday spoke about um, them putting RFID tags on toilet rolls and so they can follow him around. I, didn't, I don't know where he got that from, but I found that very interesting. Uh, and then variety, so that's a key one for us, effectively uh, analysing that different variety. So again, going back to that structure and the structured. The extra one that we'd add is, is veracity. So actually, do you trust that data? Because it doesn't matter if you do some analysis on data you don't trust, it then it, you're not going to trust it. I'm sure you have it in every day, I, I, the jobs you do, I have it, I get a spreadsheet, I question a few numbers and then I do the analysis and I'm like, well, I don't trust that analysis because I don't trust the data it's come from. You've got to have that. And then these bottom two have a little star on them because they're my personal. Uh, they're not IBM, so using the disclaimer we talked about before, this is my personal view. Understand the value of that data source. If you don't know what the value, some data admittedly is not going to be valuable and you don't want to be analysing that. Some data is very valuable, and only you will know that for your institutions or where you work. And then visibility. Can you see that some of that data? There's a lot of organisations that we talk to actually can't... They know they've got the data, but they can't see it, and they can't get to it in time for when it actually matters to them and what they want to do with that data. So that's what IBM thinks are the characteristics of big data. So let's talk about some case studies. Now... These aren't from education I'm going to go through, but they give you an idea of what the art of the possible is. Whenever I talk to um, different customers about, uh, about big data, I always try and open up with these, just because it gives an overall idea of what the art of the possible is. So the University of Ontario Institute of Technology are actually using it for um, babies, uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's a topic that everyone can understand, so it's one that I like to use. Every time a premature, and I don't know, I don't have experience of this, so I can't claim, but um, every time a premature baby is born, uh, they are very likely to have a seizure. Uh, and if the, the cure is out there for this seizure, it's just you have to give that cure uh, the right time and, and they'll be fine. And most people aren't aware, aware of this as a, as a problem. So um, the, the, the way that they traditionally do it is they have a nurse walking around the ward looking at the babies, looking for the specific symptoms um, of those babies in, in the ward. Um, now, what uh, they've been able to do with big data is actually you take all the uh, analysis and all that data feeding off the baby from all the tubes and wiring, which um, I don't find particularly pal palatable, but obviously it needs to be there. Um, essentially, all that comes out, and they're analysing that on the fly, so as it goes, and they're able to identify 24 hours sooner than the nurse walking around the ward um, actually when a baby is going, coming towards a seizure. As well as that, they've also identified a pattern to actually uh, be able to work out a little bit better why those seizures happen. So that's, that's helped uh, uh, save lives in, in, in this ward and is something that uh, you know, we're looking at from an IBM perspective at, 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 at you know, what we can do there. Um, now, going back to the security and privacy one, you know, I was debating about taking this out this morning after Audrey's talk, but I've kept it in because of what it can do. Now, Terra Records, uh, they are managing, uh, they manage a lot of secure places. So this is actually um, the, in America, they are managing some of the uh, nuclear uh, education sites. So obviously they've got nuclear particles on, they don't want people coming near the site because obviously there's the protective around that. And essentially what they're doing is around the perimeter fence, uh, you would just have usually a guard in the guard tower in the middle looking out um, and send out people every now and again. What they're now doing is uh, they've got sound detectors all around the outside of that perimeter fence and they're using the last uh, two to five years worth of data uh, to actually tell them when someone is approaching. So they're analysing the sounds that are coming in. So this is not data in its traditional format, i.e. 
um, structured logs or, or even text data. This is actually sound data coming in, so they can tell the difference between a fox walking towards that perimeter fence or a tree falling over 500 yards away to someone actually coming and walking towards that facility. And all they do then is they send out the guard to that area and the guard will deter that person from coming any closer because obviously they realize it's a secure facility. Now, I'm not saying that Big Brother is coming to watch you with this technology. There is very specific use cases and where you want to use it, but uh, it's just uh, an example of, of what, what that are, the possible is. Uh, and the third one is a very simple one, essentially um, infrastructure and managing infrastructure. So actually you understand that a light bulb has gone before it's even gone, or that um, you're managing those energy bill forecastings, those kind of things. All kind of, all available because we're using the massive amount of data that is out there. We're leaving it in its current format. We're sticking it in something called um, Hadoop in this case, but different tools in, in different instances and using that to actually drive out some outcome and insight that um, individually these uh, our customers have asked for. Uh, and the final one that I'll go into, because I find it quite interesting anyway, um, is the smarter crime pre prevention. So uh, Memphis State Police um, were having a free year, 3% free rise per year of crime in their state. Um, and obviously, as we all know, with uh, cuts, etc., the U.S. is just the same. They were struggling with, uh, they needed 500 more police uh, individuals to actually manage that. So they actually looked at a different way to approach it. They're using predictive analytics um, to tell them based on pre what they know from the patterns of how criminals work, um, working out the patterns of that so they can send a police car to the place where they think that crime will happen. That's actually caused a 30% cut. Now, you know, that's, you, you think that's surprising because once the criminals work out that they're working by a pattern, they'll start doing some uh, anon anomalies. But actually, the way the human brain works, you're still working to a certain pattern, even if you're trying to avoid the pattern, apparently. So um, I, fi I find that interesting. There's a really good advert, actually, uh, that IBM have done for that, if anyone else wants to uh, uh, look up at that. So. The more interesting part for you guys is what have we actually done in education? Are we going on? There we go. Uh, I apologise for the pictures. These are actually pictures from my holiday to Australia because I couldn't find any relevant pictures for this. So, um, this university in Australia has six campuses around a major city. Uh, unfortunately, not all our reference case studies allow us to name them. Um, but they have uh, a lot of students and they focus on fostering academic performance to gain the maximum benefit. And they actually created uh, an office of strategy and quality and wanted to look at what they could do to actually uh, improve um, the students who were at uh, the university uh, on, on how they go through that course and their experience all the way through that university. And so they had theories on correlation on why students uh, were dropping out or showing less interest during a course. Um, these were uh, range from the, their level of language, their gender, their entry scores and their socio-economic status. So they decided to measure and actually monitor um, with student opinion and coursework and performance uh, and actually work out if their hunches and what they believed to be true was actually true. Uh, and what IBM have been able to do with this predictive analytics tool, using all that data that they've collected from previously, identifying the patterns to that, um, they uh, can now identify risk factors quickly and accurately uh, and can intervene proactively uh, to reduce class failures and dropout rates. Now, when I'm not at this point saying that we remove the tutor or anyone who is involved on the face-to-face -face basis. I agree with Audrey this morning when she talked talk about actually, you know, I remember when I was, electro, uh, when I was at university, the face-to-face -face was what really drove the value for me. Um, but if you can, before you're actually aware of it from an individual perspective, be warned to a percentage of, of we are 75% certain this person is dropping out because of X, Y, and Z, because these four people in the past have shown that um, correlation of behaviour, then you can identify to that tutor or individual to maybe, you know, it might just be send them the send them an email to say um, there are these funding courses available because we know that they're from, uh, you know, they might be struggling with finances. 
or it might be the tutor go, just goes and have a word with them and say, are you struggling? But that decision is still made from the institution. That decision is not made by any tool that we tell you, you've got to go and do this. We give you what, the, um, what we think the reasons are why, and we, we, we can tell you, uh, we can help you make that decision, but we will not make that decision on your behalf. Uh, I told you I'd talk about London South Bank University a bit more. So uh, they took uh, all of what we call sorry about that, um, our exceptional student experience. Um, that we have these leaflets in the handout in, uh, in our stand outside if you want to come and grab one. But uh, essentially, the key part of that exceptional student experience for London South Bank University was all around uh, predictive analytics and being able to predict when students drop out. Um, they have quite a high rate in their personal view of, of, of dropouts, and they wanted to reduce that. They're doing that through uh, several areas, including collaboration and how those students collaborate with each other, their tutors, etc. But um, uh, the key benefit to them is, is reducing, uh, reducing dropouts. Um, American Public University are uh, the open university in, in America, uh, and they, uh, again, are and this is going back to that point where we're not telling you it's definitively like this. We're actually telling you we can predict with a certain amount of certainty. And actually on the tool, it, you know, you can build it out. But essentially it's telling you we are 75% or we are 80% certain of this. So we're not saying yes. It's not a yes or no answer. It's a this is how confident we are. And you might say, well, we'll ignore it if we're not over 60% confident. That's fine. We're not telling you otherwise. But we're actually giving you uh, a helping hand, essentially, towards whatever decision you might make. And that's, again, increased retention. Um, again, Wichita State University. And I know I'm, we're now going to go into four actual US uh, examples. But uh, as uh, Jeff said on Monday, uh, US trends do come across the waters. We found, uh, and I know that Audrey talked about some of them we don't want to, but I think this is actually one that's worthwhile. Um, and then Hamilton County uh, Department of Education actually using it for their, um, and this is a, I don't think this is as, um, as relevant potentially, but they are using it for um, their teachers and the training courses that they get, they go on. So they're actually working out from the scores that their class has um, and the teacher feedback scores, actually which courses that they go on are most relevant to them and which one they're gaining most benefit from. Uh, and then finally, Michigan State University. Um, they're actually um, measuring uh, and using this tool uh, with predictive to say, uh, Tom went to Aston University, he likes sport. I can see that through social media and things. When I'm looking for a donor to donate towards a new minibus for Aston University, Tom is a good person to send that email out to because he's more likely to, to, to donate as an alumni. Essentially, I, I, again, it, it's just predicting. It's not telling you it's, dis, it's definitive, but it's saying, you know, this might be better to go to that person. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I'd just like to say we are out on stand six outside. That's the, that's the actual picture from this morning. Um, you can get these um, if you want to talk to any of us. Uh, Kaylin, who I spoke about this morning, um, uh, earlier, sorry, is the education lead at IBM, and he does, he's done a lot of these talks. I'm actually, uh, unfortunately, I'm a stand-in for Kaylin, so it's a shame you can't get him, but he's on holiday. But he does, uh, he's heavily on Twitter, and then there's all our emails on there, including uh, my colleagues from TechTrader in the middle of the building, um, and uh, who can also answer any questions that you have on this.